Next panel is living tradition of Abhidhammas. There will be uh, two speakers. First speaker is Andrew Davis, University of Toronto and Canada. The next uh, second speaker is uh, Ms. Uh, Charles Shaw, Samantha Trust from UK. And for the chair is, uh, may I now kindly invite the Venerable Dr. Devinda, Shansrik Buddhist University. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Venerable Panya Boga Bipala, for handing over the floor to me. So for this panel three, we will be focusing on the living traditions of Abhidhamma. And we have Venerable Dr. Devinda Bipala who would be chairing this session. So to introduce our chair to the audience, Venerable Dewenda Bibala, he recently got his doctorate degree with the thesis entitled A Sociological Approach to Perfections, focusing on perfection of morality, Sila Barami, with, reference to, with special reference to Venerable Kuba Bonchon, here, we more famously known as the Maim Pong Siado. Then Venerable Dewey Dabi Bala also got his master's degree from the University of Kalinia in Sri Lanka and his BA degree from BPU in Sri Lanka, that is Buddhist and Pali University. He also holds a Pariyati Sadama Bala Dhammajariya from Banglong and recently a lecturer at the Shan State Buddhist University, SSBU, and at the Sariputta Buddhist College in Muse. So not taking much of the time, may I hand over the floor to our Venerable Chair, please. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, uh, our MC, for inviting me to be the chair of this session. Uh, this is the panel three. It will be on living tradition of Apitama. We have two speakers here. And uh, the first speaker will be Master Andrew Ted, University of Toronto, Canada. And he will be speaking about dimensions of the sociocultural phenomenon of Patana, recitation, skill, configuration, and continuum. So without taking much uh, your time, may I now call up on the Mr. Andrew to present your paper, please. Great. Well, um, thank you first of all to the organizer, uh, Dr. Pupio Jaw, for putting this together and this uh, wonderful burgeoning institution, this uh, Shan State Buddhist University and the rector, uh, Venerable Dr. Kamai Damasami, in supporting this conference. It's a fantastic opportunity for me. Uh, and, and thanks for the opportunity and this encouragement to further structure some thought on the phenomenon of uh, Patana recitation in Myanmar. I've previously considered this event in terms of its placemaking effects and uh, soundscapes that it produces, uh, something I could discuss further in the Q&A. But today I've decided to offer a few other dimensions of the Patana recitation. Uh, that is scale, configuration, and continuum. Um, so uh, this includes the Patan Pue, which I have looked at more closely before, uh, but I'm trying to expand to look beyond the Patan Pue or the 24-hour recitation of the Patan. Uh, to note, these are preliminary dimensions that I'm developing. They overlap and spill into each other. However, I see them and use them as my uh, ethnographic heuristics, and I want to share them with this group because they, they may be useful for members of this audience as well and thinking about uh, reci Patana recitation in Myanmar and maybe in other places. Um, as the Patana is endless and immeasurable, so would be the sociocultural dimensions associated with it. However, today I attempt to descriptively move within that infinite a little bit. So I first encountered the extended recitation of the Patana during my first week of a month-long ordination uh, at a monastery in Shan State in 2009. In 2012, I returned to Myanmar to complete fieldwork for my master's degree in anthropology, energetically and presumptuously requesting my hosting Sayadaw to teach me the Patana, to which he quickly quizzed me on the basics of the Abhidhammata Sangaha. I failed because I had not studied it closely yet, and we began rehearsing the Thinjo for the next few months. 
Uh, my Sayadaw had become blind later in life, and I was amazed how he could recall the Thinjo after my reciting the first few words of the verse we would study, my eyes and finger then silently following the words on the page that he brought to life. Although, to my chagrin, I quickly learned that at this scholarly monastery, the Vatana was not recited in Pue form as it, was closely, as it was closely studied there. In my free time away from the monastery, I attempted to find and follow as many Athamase Patan Pue, or uh, the 24-hour recitation of the Patan festivals, as I could. Luckily, it was, in, it was the Dinjut in Upper Myanmar, and in that year, a few Patan Pue were to be found. Since then, I have returned to Mandalay in 2018 uh, for further language study and research surrounding uh, a separate case. And then again this year for the past month in, the Man in Mandalay began and Pakoku, where I've been talking with people about their prayer repertoires when they shiko uh, or when they go to the pagoda and peasa uh, yepet or recite uh, parita or other um, uh, scripture at the pagoda. So in this presentation then, I'm attempting to draw out some dimensions of the varieties of Patana recitation that I observed over time, albeit unevenly and idiosyncratically. That is, part of my point here is not to closely analyze a particular festival or instance of recitation, but attempt to draw out and consider the general dimensions of a variety of actual instantiations of Patana recitation. I'm not creating an abstract or ideal instance from which to theorize, a normative model of Patampue and individual recitation can be found in Burmese manuals or Parita chanting books. However, we can compare and contrast these models with actual instant instantiations, of course, perhaps not necessarily privileging one over the other, or at least approaching each with different sets of questions. Uh, in describing these dimensions, I draw from Oops, I'll just move this over here. In describing these dimensions, I draw from the auto-theorization offered by my Burmese respondents. Some Abhidhamic theorizing, which I'd like to develop in the future, and this conference is giving me an opportunity to develop that ability to enfold Abhidhamic theorizing onto the phenomena of Patana recitation. Um, I'm also informed by the work of Marcel Maus, Andreas Bandak, Birgit Myers, and Talal Asad. Uh, from Mar Marcel Maus, I look more specifically to his previously unpublished doctoral thesis titled On Prayer. Um, and perhaps for those uh, familiar with um, the sociology of religion, this was submitted under the apparently disencouraging advising of Emile Durkheim. Um, it, there's a funny story behind him finishing, attempting to finish his thesis while also being put to quite a bit of work for Emile Durkheim, who was a prolific publisher in the um, sociology, anthropology of religion. Uh, in Mouse's own work, though, Mouse defines prayer as, quote, a religious rite which is oral and bears directly on the sacred. He further discusses differentiations between varieties of oral rites, incantations, spells, and so forth. Um, I'm not going to interrogate Mouse's taxonomy and definitions at this point, but his attention and focus on prayer can be a generative starting point to think about recitation in the context of Burmese Buddhism. That is to say, in simplest terms, the social cultural phenomena of Patana recitation is an oral rite engaging a sacred Burmese Buddhist text. So then how else can Mouse's theorizing help us? Critically, Maus identifies the central phenomenon of prayer in a variety of re religious traditions, as well as its social content. That is, people are taught to pray and socialized into prayer. The role of the individual is important, but secondary to the social. He also identifies prayer as a ritual that involves posturing, for example, standing, kneeling, prostrating, positioning of the hands and eyes. Again, this is helpful for developing ethnographic approaches and foci in considering Buddhist recitation practices. Furthermore, Mouse notes prayer as a ritualized form of speech that acts. Specifically, he notes that what makes prayer efficacious is its intimate and profound action on consciousness. So this, uh, tapping into our, oops, um, Abhidhamma content for the conference. 
So Mauss's work has been uh, productively picked up in the anthropology of Christianity. In Andreas Bondak's uh, The Social Life of Prayers, Bondak suggests extending Mauss's writing on prayer to include dimensions of his other work, specifically on the gift, um, magic, and what he calls techniques of the body, which unfortunately Mauss did not articulate himself in his work on prayer. Talal Assad, anthropologist of religion, Islam, and secularism, also engages Mauss to consider translation, Quranic Arabic, and what he calls the sensible body. I have not yet encountered an engagement of this theorization of prayer, language, and the body in the anthropology of Buddhism. Arguably, this may be due to navigating the post-colonial hoops and monotheistic biases of anthropological theorizing more generally, and its relevance or not for Buddhist contexts. For example, we can question the use of prayer in English. We can ask, do Buddhists pray? How can we discuss and differentiate the Burmese terms of shiko, gada, or sut down, uh, peasa, yupet, and different terms for hearing or listening in Buddhist contexts in everyday life. However, I think there can be some fruitful engagement if we steer this theorizing within Dhammic or Burmese terms. I'm also informed by the work of Birgit Myers, who has identified the significance of aesthetic formations in order to think beyond print culture as a mode of how people imagine themselves within communities, building off of Benedict Anderson's thesis on imagined communities. That is, Myers and contributors to her project attempt to account for multiple media and greater fluidity in the working ways of fostering imagined communities, or more specifically, religious imaginaries, either nation-bound, linguistic, for example, in our case, relating to Pali, or otherwise. Finally, we can return to the Burmese engagement with the Abhidhamma and attempt to consider how, in listening, and recitation of Patana, we can imply an Abhidhamic lens, which has been fruitfully discussed at other points in this conference. Um, I must remind that these, these are theoretically informing my ethnographic approach, and of course, I have not yet attempted linking all of this into this presentation specifically, but I wanted to highlight a little bit of the um, theorizing. So to begin with a certain ethnographic proximity then, let's consider scale. Uh, by scale here, I'd like to highlight two things, namely scale as intonation and scale as in size. So in the first example of considering scale, I'd like to draw attention to the variety of voices that animate and vocalize the patana. Um, so here I have a video that was sent to me by a friend actually of a group of Thielishin at the Shwedagon Pagoda. And um, it's just eight, eight, eight seconds and the camera is a little bit wobbly, but just, just as an example to think about prayer. So here the nun's tone is quite high and they carry a particular rhythm as they articulate purima. I requested a friend send me her video after showing it to me on my on the phone of a, as a great example of just the range and variety of voices that animate and vocalize the patana. Um, and a second example, please listen again and you can consider the difference in tone of the recitation here. So again, these examples, these are examples of louder public recitations. The patana, the patana is also recited quietly under the breath at home or in pagodas while driving in the car, riding the bus. I've heard the sound of the patana through the wooden floorboards of homes. Several respondents have described to me their particular memories of hearing their parents 
recite the Patana early in the morning or in the evening before they slept. One respondent even mentioned wanting to make a recording of his mother reciting the Patana within her morning shikoh routine uh, before she passed away. There are also examples of mental recitations visible via practitioners sitting with a book in front of them, turning the pages quietly and opposite, oppositely, those thunderously reciting the Patana from memory without a text at all. There are the, the examples from when I've heard the Patana from a distance on rooftops in Mandalay or down uh, the Arawadi River in Bagan. I have heard the Patana blasted from multiple tall speakers within the Mahamuni compound. In this instance, the amplification technology duly amplified the movement of air as children jumped across the pulse blasts it produced, um, uh, similar to a fire hydrant spraying water. Yet here they were jumping through the air blasts produced through the amplification of the Patana. Each of these instances engage their own kind of scale. Here I note scale is not always an impersonal register that we may think of uh, in a musical scale with that technica technicality mechanically noted, but is produced by particular voices and registered within a socially symbolic system. Perhaps this gets away from an Abhi Abhidhamic analysis proper, but registering it and noting it is, is simply different language for um, equanimously registering scale. Or thinking of this, we can think of this in terms of ubeka as well, as just sort of recognizing this as sound. Um, yeah. So what if any significance is there to this variety? How or should we capture and consider the significance of different voices reciting the patana, different amplifications? How are those voices viewed within the tradition and without? What are the sensibilities of local aesthetics? How does the dimension of scale and patana recitation unite and divide Buddhist practice more broadly? Um, for example, Hiroko Kawanami, an anthropolo another anthropologist in her research on Thielishin in Myanmar, has identified how some Thielishin are trained for their voices to become deep and croaky uh, to sound like men. She writes, as their, vibrant, as their vibrant voices add another level of authenticity and magic to a ritual, the role of chanting has become elevated as an important occupation. Paul Green, as an ethnomusicologist, has analyzed monastic parita chanting in the US and developed the idea of dhamma as sonic praxis, or the patterning of sound in Burmese Buddhist practice. He further argues that innate to Pali texts are particular metric rhythms that produce specific melodies and rhythms in their idealized, as well as likely well-practiced and produced instances. These particularities uh, quote, steer practitioners away from dangerous or potentially distracting musicalities while inspiring mindfulness of the suttas and the memorization of the parita. And yet, what of those less than skillfully produced recitations? What sounds are those? Most Burmese respondents tell me that the right intonation, rhythm, and pronunciation are essential for easy capture, reception, and correct understanding of the patana. All voices are not created equal here, and some voices make comprehension through sheer listening more pleasurable and palatable than others, and this, can, and this skill can be cultivated. Still, apart from the normative outlook, these other voices are there, reading the same text, either intentionally working on improving their tone or simply engaging the text, reciting it in their own way. And to re return to Mouse, intimately and profoundly acting on their own consciousness. Finally, I'm also told it is agudo, or demeritorious, to judge the tone. Um, I ask, uh, so that we have that as well, you know, to think of when we think about scale, uh, to kind of make judgments of different tones. You might be accruing demerit um, even by making a judgment. And uh, maybe we can get into um, more of detail with this later. In the, in the Abhidhamic sense, these other voices can be recognized as sound, perceived by the ear consciousness when contacting the sound object, and we can listen without judgment or at least that's uh, how I might understand it in the Abhidhamic terms. Here, even sweet scales and intonation should not be sought, at, sought after all, perhaps. I venture gusala leading to agusala, registering good sound, then becomes agusala, um, wanting more of the good. Uh, if you have an attraction to the good sound, uh, you have to be careful because this is uh, when seeking something good can become agusala uh, in, that, in that sense. This is something I ha I'll have to work out more.
And the second meaning of scale, I'd like to draw attention to the number of participants in any uh, instance of recitation. How many people or other sentient beings in any instance join in for reciting or listening to the patana? How does the number of people participate, participating in the recitation also affect the tonal scale? What effect do the number of listeners have on the recitation? That is, people recite individually in groups of two, three, four, five, so on, with groups of friends, family members, coworkers, dhamma, dhamma hall groups, meditation groups, monastic groups, scaling up to uh, the patan pue as a large-scale production, um, or where you may find uh, one monk or occasionally two monks reciting at one time. Even when people recite alone, they may not be in complete solitude. At pagodas, in particular, images. Um, People may be reciting packed in closely, quite closely together, uh, reciting alone uh, at Mahamuni, for example, or they might enjoy a more spacious setup. And what about the gnats, or hungry ghosts, or spirits, or animals, uh, those that can hear or not hear? How many join in to listen to any one recitation at a particular time? So here, here I'm talking about scale in terms of the size. That is the number of individuals involved and affected by the tone of the recitation produced, or to account for those drawn in by the sound. Uh, so my next ver uh, variable here is configuration in examining uh, Patana recitation. So with configuration, generally I'm more specifically considering who is involved. Who are the people involved in any particular recitation? How are they related to each other? How might they be differently arranged in any instance of Patana recitation? I had mentioned this previously in considering scale, that is by referring to family, family groups, uh, co-worker groups, Dhamma hall, uh, recitation communities, meditation groups, monastic group members reciting uh, the Patana together. So for example, for a visitor to a Patanpue, this is most obviously represented in the charts and signage that specifically list the monks that will recite. That fam the families, so the, on the image closest to me over here, this is a list of the, the names of the monks that will recite and the order in which they will recite, alternating with, uh, in this instance, it was 30 minute shifts. Sometimes they do one hour shifts of reciting the Patan. In the second image, these are the lists of the, the families involved in donating um, the food in the morning and in the afternoon. And finally, the, in the, the poster board on the far right, we have a list of the volunteers involved uh, in maintaining the compound as the patana is recited. So here, these are all of these people are brought together um, in, order, in this recitation of the patan. Um, and then I just thought this was, you know, we can even think of the Pue configuration incorporating the electrician uh, who may manage or repair a set of amplifiers to ensure the unceasing broadcast. So in this instance, there were two amplifiers set up um, that would be alternated between if one became hot or overheated. And, and again, what about the gnats, the spirits, or animals? Uh, sometimes these are invited to listen as well. There are, there are specific verses, of course, to invite um, nats and devas uh, to listen to the recitation of the Patan. So do we include them when we're thinking about the configuration of any recitation in one instance? Uh, beyond the Pue configuration, walking around the Shwedagon, Mahamuni, or smaller compounds, we see all varieties of individuals brought together for recitation. I've seen a mother and father lined up with their children, reciting from a large print text laid out in front of them, brothers and sisters, coworkers, and of course the configurations of one. Uh, or as this image shows here, um, people brought in via phones. Uh, so on the image on the right, it's not, you can kind of see the, the white object. There's a woman sitting in the front who was putting her phone to the Mahamuni image, and she left it there for quite an extended period of time, uh, seemingly indicating to me that maybe the people that were uh, brought in via the phone were um, shikoing, or they may have been reciting through the phone as well. This is something that I just noticed recently and have to um, further uh, look at. Let's see. 
So these are just, again, I'm using this as an ethnographic heuristic and way uh, to think about Patana recitation. Okay, finally, um, when examining Patana recitation, I think it's important to think of the variable of continuum of Pali literacy. Uh, that is, when we think of the Patampue, the Patampue can be, be identified in part as a form of public pedagogy. Uh, it's an opportunity for people to hear the Patan, and as much attention as you put to it or not, there's kind of there's a public pedagogy uh, element to that, to the to that amplification. And but when we think of continuum, on one end we have uh, the non-expert who recites the Patana uh, without studying the meaning, perhaps, and on the other end, maybe we can say, you know, Ashin Nandamala Vivamsa, who understands the Patana very well and can explain it um, to many people. So when I'm talking about continuum here, I'd like to draw attention to the varieties of ways that people are, the varieties of literacies that people have when engaging Pali, um, particularly in the context of the recitation of the Patan. So here in this photo, we can see an individual um, using headphones who I, I am presuming with the book there that he is listening to a recitation of the text that he is following. Uh, and I saw this, it, surprisingly, I noticed this more this year than in the past, that there were more people who would use headphones uh, when they would go to the pagoda to um, recite a text, teaching themselves, uh, or having the opportunity to hear the proper recitation of a Pali text, teaching themselves, um, and maybe reciting along with a particular recitation. And, Dr. Pipio Jha has also identified in, your, in her article, Foundations of Criticality, Applications of Traditional Monastic Pedagogy in Myanmar, uh, that this, the memorization and the rote learning uh, of these texts that people engage in provides some foundation for eventual critical study and engagement with this text. And so we, in these instances, these people may be teaching themselves or memorizing these texts uh, for later further engagement with the content of the Patana. And I think when we look at Patana recitation, we should be cognizant of this continuum of literacy and not just kind of think of, oh, they have no idea what they're reciting, um, that people are actually engaging in uh, different modes of literacy, literacy in Pali. I've also noticed this year um, an increase of uh, Parita chanting books at pagoda compounds and uh, that are almost set up, you know, you can go into a pagoda, there's a, um, a case with different books, chanting books that are available. And I've seemed to, maybe other people have something to say about this, but they seem to be kind of increasing. Here, um, this was just a, in a bookstore in Mandalay. And I'm here I'm drawing attention to the availability of different texts that Burmese people can pick up. Um, to study the meaning of these texts, to practice the pronunciation of these texts. I'm not sure how I'm doing for time. It's okay? Okay. So again, not to base the whole, this, this variable on the status of accurate literacy, but it is a significant um, issue for a number of people. People want to be able to recite these texts correctly. And I think a number of people are aspiring for that and they're using a variety of means um, to be able to recite this uh, accurately. And we can see this in the availability of books or different media that people engage um, for that. However, also, I don't want to overemphasize that people are also making, poten you know, potentially making their own meanings in reciting the Patan. Uh, so, in conclusion, I felt in the past that the attitudes or positions towards Patana recitation have sometimes become a bit one-dimensional. There are the experts who recite the text and understand it completely, and the masses who don't understand and simply recite the text to protect themselves against danger. Although Ashin Nanda Mala Vivamsa today thoughtfully addressed 
um, these complexities in his opening talk today about how people, in, uh, Burmese people, engage the Patana in their own ways, picking up these texts and reciting them or teaching themselves how to recite them in a way that we can be conscious of. This presentation uh, then has been an attempt to consider recitation practices, particularly surrounding the Patana, more generously and robustly with at least three dimensions in order to expand our consideration of what is the Patana and what are the multiple modes of engaging it. By considering these dimensions, we consider how the Patana engages us as well. I hope that these dimensions may be useful in future discussions on recitation and the study of Buddhism. Finally, it's critical to consider the Patana not only as an intellectual object to be studied meticulously, but engaged, recited, and reflected on deeply in multiple modes. The recitation of the Patana is something that affects everyday life in Myanmar, and therefore also consciousness. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for, for your <clears throat> wonderful presentation. It's very interesting and very informative about uh, Myanmar Patan Boy, uh, the Patana recitation ceremony in Myanmar. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to introduce our speaker. Uh, he, his name is Andrew Dead. He's a PhD student uh, in the Department for the Study of Religion at the University of Toronto in Canada. He is interested in the work of sound, silence, and recitation for Buddhist tradition in particular, and many other traditions comparatively. His research background includes the anthropological Buddhism, anthropology of religion, and library and information science. Thank you very much for your <coughs> presentation. And before we take the question and answer, let me move to another speaker. I think we can ask questions at the end of the two presentations. Uh, now I would like to <clears throat> introduce the next speaker, uh, Mr. Chow Shaw. He was born in England, and in the early 1970s, he, he studied, he's writing in the first person, so <laughs> I'm reading as a second person. <laughs> And he studied history of art at the University of Manchester. And it was there that he first made contact with the teachings of the Buddha. And this came about through meeting Lanka Sen, who was both a scholar of Pali and Buddhist studies, and also a practitioner who founded the Samatha Trust, a UK charity which supports the tradition of Samatha Vipassana, breathing mindfulness introduced from Thailand to the UK by Nai Bonman Bonyatiro in the early 1960s and provided meditation classes and a wide range of study groups, including Abhidhamma. He retired as a university administra administrator in, uh, in 2017, having worked at Liverpool John Moore Universities and since 1995, the University of Oxford. He continued to support the work of the Samatha Trust and together with Langasen made a translation of the Yamaka and its commentary. So he will be <coughs> speaking about the uh, Abhidhamma, some first step in the ocean. So please, uh, the floor is yours. So thank you very much, Bante, and uh, venerable sirs, sister, and friends and colleagues in the audience. Um, could I start by uh, echoing Andrew's fine words of, of thanks to all those who have been responsible for organizing this conference and the workshop that preceded it. Uh, I must say it's been a truly wonderful experience to come here, both enjoyable and insightful. Um, and it's, uh, I must say, remarkable to see how much has been achieved here in such a, a very short space of time. So thank you very much for the opportunity to come here. Um, further to the introduction, I guess um, as a proof that I'm not as young as um, might have been suggested, uh, my only prop is not a computer, but a piece of paper. So that is probably a signal of my age. Um, I should also say that I'm very conscious that I have the onerous responsibility of standing between the audience and its cup of tea. But anyway, I'm sure you will 
Hang in there. <laughs> so, the talk is called Abhidhamma, Some First Steps in the Ocean. And I guess the underlying theme is to try and draw out some trains of thought which may be helpful in supporting the growth of Abhidhamma studies and practice in parts of the world where it is not already familiar. So, as I am sure we can all agree, we have many reasons to be thankful for participating in this conference. Principally, of course, we have the opportunity to thank Venerable Damasami on his 55th birthday and to thank him most sincerely for all that he has done, both here at Chan State Buddhist University and in so many other places around the world. The last time that my wife and I visited him at Oxford Buddha Vihara, the conversation somehow turned to a discussion of bodhisattvas. On reflection, that seems to have been not at all inappropriate. Another reason to be grateful is that we are able to discuss Abhidhamma in a part of the world and in a university which enjoys such a rich and deep-rooted tradition in the study and practice of Abhidhamma. We know that we are, as it were, amongst friends. However, the same cannot necessarily be taken for granted in other parts of the world, where the appreciation of Buddhist thought in general, and of Abhidhamma in particular, are at a much earlier stage of development and are thus significantly less familiar. At the extremes, unfamiliarity can breed mistrust and rejection. It is therefore perhaps worth considering why this is the case and what steps might be taken to foster the development of Abhidhamma studies as a living tradition in new environments where it has yet to take root. One of the best known passages of Pali chanting, the Itipiso verses which proclaim the virtues of the Triple Gem, include amongst the features of the Buddha's teaching the quality of akaliko. I have the technology. Of no fixed time. In other words, that its value is not limited to a particular time or cultural environment, but rather has the potential at least to be brought to life and followed at any time. But we should not expect this potential to be realized randomly or of its own accord. As with any new growth, it requires the ground to be prepared and the new shoots nurtured and cared for in such a way as to enable them to take root and flourish. So before going on to looking at the Abhidhamma, some preliminary thoughts from the suttas. As a preliminary to considering the Abhidhamma, there are two passages from the Sutta Pitaka which may help to provide some useful guidelines for our inquiries. Both of these involve the use of simile, not of course a mode of expression that is associated with the Abhidhamma Pitaka. In the Singsapa Sutta, the Buddha compares a small handful of leaves that he has taken from the forest floor with the vast and incalculable number of leaves to be found throughout the forest. The leaves in the forest are compared with the full extent of the knowledge of a Buddha, whereas the small number that he holds in his hand are compared to that element of his knowledge which he incorporates into his teaching. The distinguishing feature of those Dhammas, that handful of leaves, is that they all contribute towards the goal of realizing the Four Noble Truths. Against this background, it is therefore helpful to bear in mind that Abhidhamma should be approached not as an abstract philosophical conjecture, but as a practical tool. Like all tools, there is a time and place to which it is suited and others to which it is not. Like all medicines, knowing when it is suitable, it is not suitable, is as important as knowing as when it can offer a cure. But we should above all recognize the place of Abhidhamma in the Pali Canon as a valuable piece of the whole. And to those who would object that the Abhidhamma did not evolve until after the time of the Buddha, one might suggest that there still needs to be a good reason to depart from the standards set by the Buddha as described in the suttas. In this case, that teachings should be developmental and not merely speculative. The second simile, is that of the snake from the Alagadupama Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya. Here the Buddha compares two ways of taking hold of a snake, one unskillful and one skillful. 
In the first case, there are those who are too casual by half and without due care and attention grasp the snake by the body or the tail, in response to which the snake wraps itself around the arm of the would-be captor and bites him. Others, however, approach carefully and placing a forked stick behind the head of the snake in order to hold it to the ground, are then able to grasp it by the neck and to hold it safely without being bitten. This simile is relatively well known in the Buddhist world, though possibly the point which is it is intended to illustrate is less well known. The image of a dangerous snake presents itself as something apparently threatening and unwelcome. And yet, in fact, the Buddha is using the snake as a simile for his own teaching. He is delivering a rather forceful message that engaging with his teaching is not something to be approached casually or carelessly, but rather should only be undertaken with appropriate care and respect, quotes, examining the meaning of those teachings with wisdom. According to the Sutta, the Buddha concludes, those teachings being wrongly grasped by them conduce to their harm and suffering for a long time. Why is that? Because of the wrong grasp of those teachings. Sadly, the history of engagement with Abhidhamma in the West is littered with examples of those who have felt the bite of Abhidhamma. A celebrated example is provided by Mrs. Rhys Davids in the introduction to her edition of the Pali text of the Yamaka, the Book of Pairs, which is the sixth book of the Abhidhamma Pitaka, published by the Pali Text Society in 1911, where she likens the ten chapters of the Yamaka to, quotes, valleys of dry bones. The reader, she says, is baffled and chilled. It is no doubt to her considerable credit that for all her antipathy towards her subject matter, she nevertheless saw through to completion the considerable task of providing an edition of the Yamaka in Roman script running to six to some 600 pages in length. And at that very early stage of Pali and Buddhist studies in the UK, when little would have been available by way of explanation or encouragement, it is perhaps unsurprising that she recoiled from what is recognized generally as one of the more difficult Abhidhamma texts. Nevertheless, one cannot help feeling that her task would have been made somewhat less burdensome had she been able to bear in mind the message of the simile of the snake. To her, to her further credit, she acknowledges that in the right hands, it might indeed be possible to turn the chapters of the Yamaka into, quotes, living and breathing vehicles of doctrine. So now something on the meanings of Abhidhamma. If it has not been written yet, and it may well have been, there is surely an interesting paper to be written on the names adopted by the different Buddhist schools and traditions of practice across the centuries. For a new movement that is seeking to gain visibility in a previously populated and perhaps increasingly crowded marketplace, there must have been a temptation to adopt a name or a label that sought to set it apart from or even above existing schools, albeit schools within the same broad tradition of, Buddh of Buddhism. A simple, of a simple example of this is the term Mahayana, or greater vehicle, which carries an implication of superiority to earlier traditions which it labelled Hinayana, or lesser vehicle. There is a balance to be struck between, on the one hand, encouraging those who may be attracted to the new movement, whilst at the same time avoiding unnecessary friction with existing schools of thought. And I should add there that, uh, for example, I've heard a number of teachers in the Tibetan tradition describe Mahayana and Hinayana not as names for particular schools of practice, but rather as stages of practice which need to be gone through by uh, practitioners in any school. In any event, as lessons from the contemporary world of marketing and PR would suggest, it is usually better not to believe too much in one's own publicity. So, turning to the Abhidhamma, what do we mean by Dhamma, that is, Abhi? The, the website Sutta Central lists 54 instances of the use of the word Abhidhamma, mostly in the Pali Canon. With respect to the Abhidhamma Pisika, the term Abhidhamma occurs once in the Matika, distinguishing between Abhidhamma Matika and Suttanta Matika, and as a major frame of reference in the Vibhanga, the Book of Analysis, where sets of Dhammas are subjected to analysis according to Abhidhamma, alongside analysis according to Suttanta, and other things. But the word Abhidhamma does not, incur, not occur in any of the other six books. 
It is posited by some that the texts of the Abhidhamma Pitaka belong to a relatively late stage in the development of the Pali Canon. At first sight, this might seem to be reflected in the term Abhidhamma itself, with Abhi taken to imply a sense of superiority or intensification, in both cases necessarily in relation to something that has gone before. However, as we have just seen, the texts which now comprise the Abhidhamma Pitaka make very little use of the term Abhidhamma. So whilst the label Abhidhamma has sometimes been used in a conscious attempt to elevate those teachings above other forms of Dhamma, we should perhaps not assume that this was part of the mindset of those who first compiled the texts of the Abhidhamma Pitaka. When considering the relation of these texts to the rest of the Pali Canon, we should not be distracted by the title Abhidhamma. Perhaps translating it, therefore, as further Dhamma, rather than higher or superior, helps to place these texts at the latter end of an evolving canon of teaching without separating them off too sharply from earlier phases. So now something about living traditions. What is a living tradition? At its simplest, it is a tradition that affects one's life. But the implications of that are profound. It means that to be a living tradition, the teaching of Abhidhamma must not only impart a set of ideas or constructs, but must also embed itself at the heart of how someone experiences and understands the world. It is not enough to affect their opinions to be about what they think. It must be about what they know or what they are. This takes us back to that small handful of leaves held by the Buddha in the Singsipa forest. My own first contact with Buddhist thought and practice came through meeting the late L.S. Cousins, a well-known scholar of Pali and Buddhist studies at the University of Manchester, and also an early, pra early, early practitioner and subsequent teacher within the Samatha Vipassana tradition of breathing mindfulness introduced uh, from Thailand by Naibunman Punyatiro in the early 1960s. Perhaps another definition of a living tradition could be a teaching that is conducted with skillful means. Certainly the method by which, after about three years, Lance Cousins introduced the notion of Abhidhamma to his early meditation students was an example of that. A new and unfamiliar word, Abhidhamma, was introduced into his vocabulary from time to time. But at the first sign of interest from the group in finding out more, he was immediately discouraging, saying that it was a very difficult topic and would require an enormous amount of work. Curiosity aroused, People persisted and persisted, until eventually he agreed, he agreed to take a class on the Abhidhamma to Sangha. On the clear understanding, however, that people would be required to commit to it for a sustained period of time. In the event, the group lasted for about three years, and a number of people then went on to study some of the canonical texts. In the, in the terms of the six particular Chaitasakas, sorry, the slides have got slightly behind. Here we are. Uh, and again. There we go. In the terms of the six particular Chaitasakas listed in the Abhidhamma Sangha, he had, he had first provided us with an initial contact, Vitaka, which in response to his reticence had developed into further questioning as to what this was all about, Vichara. When he had judged that we had worked up a sufficient head of steam such that it was genuinely important to us to engage fully with the Abhidhamma, our interest was released onto Adimoka, the study and practice of the text. After which, having been suitably primed for the task, we were able to provide the necessary vigor, virya, and enthusiasm, piti, to see the task through to completion. In other words, he was determined to ensure that we grasped the Abhidhamma by the neck so that we could learn from it rather than being bitten by it. One of the means by which Lance Cousins sustained interest in Abhidhamma over the years was to invite to Manchester a range of speakers on different aspects of Abhidhamma. And perhaps the most memorable of these was a senior Burmese monk, Venerable Unyanika, who in 1987 gave a series of talks on the Yamaka. His mastery of the material and the flexibility with which he was able to apply it in ways which were intelligible to an audience that had not experienced, that had experienced none of the traditional schooling in Abhidhamma, were most impressive. At one point he was asked, how had he come to learn about the Yamaka? 
He explained that as a young monk, he had first spent a couple of years learning by heart the Pali text, some 600 pages in, hev in the heavily abbreviated Pali Text Society edition, before then going on to study the meaning. The effect of internalizing so thoroughly the text and its meaning was very striking. When asked a question, he would turn his mind to the relevant passage in the text as if leafing through a vast internal encyclopedia and in due course chant the relevant passage. Typically, he would then give the orthodox explanation of the passage, followed by some further discussion with the questioner to help them understand the meaning within the terms of their own experience. This was both deeply impressive as well as somewhat daunting, since although his method was so clearly effective, it relied on a skill set that was no longer available to us. Western literature of the 19th century commonly carries reference, references to people learning by heart large parts of the Bible. But unlike in Myanmar, for example, where the annual testing of those who would have attempted to commit to memory one of the Pitakas or even the whole of the Pali Canon still takes place in Yangon, in Europe and elsewhere, those skills have long since declined in favor of other skills influenced by more recent technologies and spheres of interest. This is what gives the exploration of Abhidhamma an added fascination in parts of the world that have no tradition of such study. Not only is there the challenge of understanding the material itself, but there is also the added dimension of working out what methods of study or instruction will be successful in bringing Abhidhamma to life for new audiences in new environments. In other words, of seeking to confirm that Abhidhamma is indeed Akaliko. For those who choose to accept the challenge, it must surely be the case that this is still a work in progress and one which is very much in its early stages. When the group in Manchester had finished working through the Abhidhamma to Sangha, each person was asked to write a, brief, uh, write a brief article based on their initial studies. Lance Cousins provided an afterword in which commenting on the undertaking developed, as it were, from scratch, some understanding of the deep aspects of Dhamma addressed by the Abhidhamma, he wrote, perhaps one could compare it to the building over many generations of the great medieval cathedrals of the West and the great monuments and temples of Asia. Even to take part in the clearing of the ground might appropriately give rise to gladness and awe. So, some different approaches to Abhidhamma. As we have noted above, Mrs. Rhys Davids referred to one Abhidhamma text as being like a valley of dry bones. And on the face of it, it's hard to disagree. But the question that then arises is what does the Abhidhamma expect us to do with these dry bones? One answer would be to say that Abhidhamma provides a skeleton which it then expects the reader to flesh out and bring to life in terms of their own experience. So while on the one hand, it attempts to provide a comprehensive picture of the range of mental and physical realities in the Dhammasangani and the laws which govern their interaction in the Patana, it is at the same time, perhaps consciously, incomplete, since as an instrument of practice rather than as a mere repository of dogma, it requires its audience to provide examples from their own experience. In other words, we are asked to flesh out for ourselves the bare bones provided by the text. Now let's look at some approaches from within the Abhidhamma. How does the Abhidhamma itself approach us? As for the text of the Abhidhamma Pitaka, how do they present their material? There are perhaps at least three different approaches. The Dhammasangani sets out the raw material which later volumes in the set take for granted, describing the full range of possible states of mind, citta, the mental qualities, cetasika, that, that accompany each moment of consciousness and the constituent parts of physical reality, rupa. In that sense, it is straightforwardly didactic. Interestingly, things come full circle in the seventh and final book, the Patana, Conditional Relations, which now sets out not the Dhammas themselves, but the laws that condition their arising and falling and their interaction. 
As indicated by its title, the second book in the series, the Vibhanga, or Book of Analysis, is concerned with the further analysis and explanation of dhammas already introduced in the Dhamma Sangani. This then represents a, a secondary level of instruction when the text assumes some prior familiarity with the material under consideration and places more emphasis on a deeper and more detailed explanation. One might say that it has more of a flavor of vichara, exploring in different directions, than vitaka, or making that initial contact. More of dhammavichaya, investigation of dhammas, than sati, let's call that here awareness of dhammas. But the third book, the Dhatakutta, takes things further still. Here there is no attempt either to explain core material or to explain its meaning. Indeed, one might say that the text teaches us nothing at all. But by analyzing groups of dhammas through the prism of an increasingly complex set of viewpoints, for example, by asking whether they are or are not included in each of the aggregates, kanda, spheres, ayatana, and bases, dhatu, what it does do is to thoroughly test the reader's existing knowledge, which through the mental gymnastics that are required to allow the mind to follow the analysis first one way, then another, is strengthened and deepened by that experience. So let's look a little bit more closely at the Yamaka, finally. This approach is given its fullest expression in the much longer sixth book, the Yamaka, or Book of Pairs, where the analysis shifts across multiple dimensions, sometimes singly and sometimes in combination, positive and negative, arising and ceasing, past, present and future, different classes of beings and different realms of existence, and so on. Interestingly, the first Pali English dictionary produced by the Pali Text Society says of the prefix abbey, the primary meaning of abbey is that of taking possession and mastering. So the, the notion of mastery would seem to be very much at the heart of what is being tested here, requiring, requiring as it does great dexterity in handling the range of different concepts as the text asks a seemingly endless stream of paired questions based on the paradigm, does A relate to B? and does B relate to A in the same way. It tests seemingly ad infinitum the reader's mastery of the material introduced elsewhere, particularly in the Dhammasangani. This is helpful in understanding why the Yamaka can appear at first sight to be somewhat daunting, not to say off-putting. Our customary approach to any text may be to ask what it means but in the case of the yamaka, it is perhaps at least as important that we should be looking at what it does. This applies both at the general level, as the point of analysis shifts from one viewpoint to another, and also on occasion in points of detail. So within a few lines of the opening of the first chapter, the pairs on roots, mula yamaka, we encounter the concept of roots of roots, mula mula. This is an unusual concept, possibly unique to this passage. To the question, what does it mean? The answer is in one sense quite straightforward, namely that the six roots of greed, hate, and delusion, non-greed, non-hate, and non-delusion, themselves have roots. The effect of introducing a, such a concept, however, is quite profound, since it helps to undermine the subtly eternalist notion of a single or fixed cause of something. Instead, it introduces a sense of indefinite regression as roots have their own roots, which also have roots, and so on. So while the concept may at first, seem, first sight seem strange and unexplained, its effect is wholly in keeping with the philosophy, and flux, philosophy of flux and change that underlies the whole of Avidhamma. So some final thoughts. Since a conference is also, amongst other things, a conversation, an alternative, to an, a, an alternative to ending with a conclusion might be to end with an invitation to provide comment or criticism to help that conversation and its associated thought processes on their way. In that spirit, I cannot improve on the words of Lance Cousins in a further extract from his afterword to those descriptions of early experiences in Manchester of working with the Abhidhamma to Sangha. He wrote... If the, Abhidhamma of, if the understanding of Abhidhamma in the West is still incomplete, then our incomplete knowledge expressed here 
may serve to indicate to the Abhidhamma masters of the East what it is that we need to know and what precisely are our problems. Let us hope they may respond. <laughs> Thank you very much, Charles, for your um, wonderful presentation on the Abhidhamma study in the West. You have made a lot of uh, interesting points, like uh, bringing Abhidhamma as Akalika, timeless, and also how we should study and grasp Abhidhamma by the neck. <laughs> so now is the time for question and answer. Uh, if anyone has any question, comments, or discussion, please uh, raise your hand. We will provide the mic. Okay, uh, the nun in the, at the end, please. My question is for Mr. Andrew. Yeah, thank you so much for your fruitful presentation about Patana recitation in Myanmar. So my question is, in Myanmar, um, people usually do the Patambwe, the Patana recitation for the from time to time, with the purpose of getting kusala. But uh, this is uh, started with the um, right intention. Um, but however, when the, uh, there is too much noise, then the listener's mind turns to the anger. <laughs> so um, how would you um, evaluate uh, this kind of culture in Myanmar? This is my first question. The second question is, in terms of creating kusala, what type of model uh, should be introduced in Myanmar? Thank you. I think that the, the noise uh, created by uh, Patampwe that you're addressing, I get in some sense, I've talked to meditators who might be at a Vipassana retreat as well, and then they're disturbed by the recitation of the Patan which I guess there's a certain irony there, um, maybe, but I think from what I understand that in Abhidhamic terms, we, we, can, we can just be registering this as sa sound. Ear consciousness, um, receiving the sound object, and this becomes sound. Uh, and I, I think that's the best. Otherwise, maybe, I, I've, always, I've also heard people are just turning down amplifications in the evening and things like that, and maybe overall lowering the, the volume of the recitation. I think in some, at some point there might be some kind of a, you know, ancient India renaissance where maybe people are just reciting without amplification at all. In the in US and Canada, we have a phenomenon of music concerts that are unplugged. Um, so maybe, you know, in the future in Myanmar, this kind of trend would take over where they will reproduce what recitations were in ancient India, which was, would have just been amplified by the architecture of the building that it was produced in. So at this time, I think there's a, uh, an interest and excitement ab around amplification technology and um, perhaps people are getting a little bit too excited about that and maybe we're at a curve where that will eventually kind of decline and become less popular but for right now I think the ideology is that the louder the better the more people that will hear it the more devas that will hear it the more animals that will hear it the more gudo we will get uh, and therefore you know we have to turn this up as loud as possible but I think right now there's a, a you know interesting kind of dialogue happening um, in the newspapers um, I unfortunately, and recently, I'm not sure, if, I don't think that there, this was a recitation, I don't think it was a Buddhist recitation, but I read a headline that in Irrawaddy, there was actually a stabbing uh, involved in uh, altercation over an amplification system where somebody had approached somebody to turn something down. I w haven't been able to read the article yet. I don't, it would be surprising if that were a Buddhist recitation happening at that time. It may have been something else, but that's an extreme example. Um, yeah, so, and your second question, uh, you had asked, you can rephrase it, what model of Kusala? So what type of, I mean, the, what, what type of model should we introduce, I mean, instead of um, using the loudspeakers all the time? 
Oh yeah. Well, and I get you know, and I maybe answered that already. Just yeah, with, sure, I think sure. there's kind you of a, maybe yeah, maybe there will be some kind of renaissance of you know, uh, unplugged unplugged model unplugged recitations. <laughs> perhaps I'm waiting for that to happen. I'm, you know, I'm, I think that will probably happen at some point. Thank you. Thanks for answering. Namaskar, Patira. Namaskar. Uh, my name is Paapon, uh Abhidharma teaching. <laughs> Abhidharma teacher. In the name of so may I have a chance to answer the question in Abhidham. Because uh, the voice, the voice in Abhidhamma is a rupa. A rupa is a payagata. That means it's not control, it's a voice. Voice is a voice. Nothing but when my uh, concern does, we are, oh, that's why we are imagining. Our mind is imagining. If you know the fact that the voice is a rupa, ru ru the rupa is have this, it, it has a special, special thing that is uh, rupa is uh, rupana lakana. Rupana lakana, that means it's just losing, losing. Rupa has only one thing is lose, lose, lose all the time. It's happen and lose. That is, and it's happening in apayagata. So if you know the fact that it's just a rupa, not your imagine. You when you love to hear this thing or you don't like it, that is your not the rupa. Okay, this is a, a bit of miss in in yeah. in your uh, normal life or uh, uh, we have uh, if you you know just you know the fact mm. okay <laughs> thank you very much um, can I just I have a um, I, have, I have two comments um, um, for Andrew and a question um, actually on the same topic uh, you mentioned about how Kusala could become Akusala so um, through Upanisaya, so when you look at the Pinyawara, and you can see that uh, from Kusala, and it becomes Akusala. And within that, you, you, what you will see, Satan Upanisaya, Manan Zapeti, Daitang Tanati, and then Thilan Sutan, Sutan Sagan, Pinya. So, so Sutan is also there. Sutan as in, you know, um, something heard or... Um, so, so, yes. So, so, so here it's talking about from how kusala, so, so the cause, the in, uh, intention is the kusala, but then again it could turn into akusala. So you might want to look at that. Uh, another comment is that Kate and I, we uh, wrote an article on um, the uh, Mahamuni image. And um, in it, we mention how, from an Abhidhamma point of view, you would take an, the, an image of the Buddha, in that case, Mahamuni, through object condition. So, so, so in, in Myanmar, it will be Ayong Bude, right? But here, using technology uh, via phone, via video capture, what that indicates is that technology is actually kind of making that uh, traditional way of ayong uh, beauty kind of redundant to some extent. You, can you see that? Which wasn't there when we were writing about that. So, so that, I think, is a new thing. So, so through very, you know, uh, smartphones and um, technologies. So that is, is a new thing. My question is that you showed us uh, recitation books, uh, the Payashiko uh, books and Payek uh, Saup. Then how, have you asked people how they choose which book to buy? <laughs> That question will be very interesting, I think. So how do you choose? How do you choose which Patana uh, book to buy? Uh, because practically, they are kind of saying the same thing, but in a different, different colors, uh, different covers. So, so how do you choose that? You know, that kind of question. Uh, 
No, I haven't asked people um, about that yet. And it's interesting when you do talk with people to, uh, or I mean, I think there's been a pro maybe you have a better sense of when these larger print, larger text uh, type books started being uh, published or released. Uh, because I have, you know, a very small, it's maybe this this tall kind of uh, um book, which is very tiny, and you have to look very closely, and it, but it has the Athantuet below, and then the Burmese translation. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, maybe just in the, from my own yeah. experience, within the last couple of years, I was excited to find these large print books, which kind of allow um, group recitation to happen. Actually, it started around, um about 10 years ago when I started my um, uh, PhD research. So um, it was there, but it became very popular. Nowadays, when it, wherever um, in various pagodas, you, when you see you know, pilot books, then you pick up and then it's it, Batana and, and uh, mostly Batana. Uh, and Baye and, and you know, Baye Jis of the Do. But they, these became very popular. Uh, when I was in Zagai doing my field work, uh, gosh, nearly 10 years ago, <laughs> and that was, uh, we, we didn't have any, well, we did have one or two books, large, large print books, but not so many. Last month, I've just been asking people, do you use textual aids uh, when you recite? Because you will also see people reciting from their smartphone, too. So they'll have the parita on the smartphone. Uh, and I had some images of that, but I decided not to show it because it couldn't quite tell if they were just checking their email or if they were reciting by it being a photo. But um, so one of my questions was, do you use textual aids? And was getting at more the divide of who is memorizing and who is reading um, these things to, to catch that difference of maybe if there's a generational difference or if you can see the commitment perhaps or um, talking with somebody over uh, within their own practice or their own experience. Had they used books for a period of time, and now they're not using books? Uh, so my question was around, do you use a textual aid or not? And what if you use an aid, what aid do you use? Uh, but I think, yeah, getting into the, the literature that they have at the bookstores and kind of looking more closely at the varieties or what, uh, what um, assemblies of uh, text might be together and why. Uh, sometimes, you know, you... Uh, there's the, the nat bin, so the invitation to invite the nats that may precede. Sometimes they have a particular, perhaps a standard order, but I was also asking people in what order do they recite things when they go to the pagoda. And it seemed that they would be paging through the book at different times for different things. Or they have some things memorized, and then sometimes they would go back to a textual aid. Um, so th it was, those were, my questions were more around that. But I like this idea of how do you choose which book? Um, and if there are, this opens up the questions of translations, perhaps, or I'm not, you know, looking at how the Athan Twet system works and if that if there are discrepancies and people and how those are represented in the books too okay <clears throat> any other more question okay yeah miss samso please uh, my name is samso and uh, we've uh, heard a lot about chanting patana in myanmar i would like to ask the other venerables who have uh, experiences in other Theravada countries like uh, Sri Lanka. But I would say a little bit about Thailand. It is not uh, that popular chanting of Patana, but we do chant at uh, uh, Abhidhamma School or Abhidhamma Institute like at Wat Mahathat and all the monasteries that are uh, teaching Abhidhamma. I wish that they chant more Patana and uh, the many people don't understand, and sometimes they get, get mixed up with Satipatthana. You know, so a lot of questions come to me. Are they chanting Satipatthana? So uh, I think we, like uh, the monastery of Wat Chak Deng, or Chak Deng Seodor, also when the um, Chak Deng, the previous Chak Deng Seodor passed away, uh, during the first uh, like 50 days, we chant uh, Patana almost every night, and the 
the monks from Wat Jak Deng, they do chant, but it's not the common practice in uh, other monasteries. But maybe we can hear from Sri Lanka. Yes, venerable uh, from Sri Lanka, can you share some of the, your experience about Patana recitation in Sri Lanka? Just a bit. <laughs> Oh, dear Venerable Sangha, and, uh, sorry. Please uh, stand up so that other can see you. <laughs> they can see me even if I sit down. <laughs> so, uh, dear Venerable Sangha, and uh, yes, actually, Sam Suk uh, bring a nice question about whether Sri Lankans uh, uh, recite Patana or not. Uh, I think uh, Bante also have experienced before. It's not that popular in Sri Lanka because most of the Shang monks are very... Uh, family with Sri Lankan culture, uh, as well as our guest speaker. So, uh, but still there are some monasteries, like uh, now, in, now in the Forest Monastery and uh, Dhammadura Meditation Society, they are very much into the Abhidhamma, and they chant Patana like every, uh, every year, two or three times they arrange uh, such occasions to chant Patana. Sometime 24-hour uh, chanting as well, just like in uh, Myanmar. Uh, there are some, but not actually up to that level, like Myanmar. Myanmar is like, uh, but Sri Lanka, we more have Chatubanawara Pali. Hmm? Have you heard about the book Chatubanawara Pali, which is uh, part of the chanting book, the general part of the chanting book for 24-hour uh, chanting, uh, which is also uh, considered in Sri Lanka as a part of Kutta Nikaya, but it's a little bit discussion about it. Uh, anyway, uh, that is more popular in Sri Lanka than Patana, but I hope as we wish in the future, we'll uh, try to introduce more Patana and Abhidhamma influence to Sri Lanka because Sri Lanka is more getting interest about Vinaya uh, strictly at the moment. The monastic uh, background of Sri Lanka is trying to study more Vinaya and Pali and uh, because we have struggled a lot about these matters before. So now uh, introducing the, the correct Vinaya to the monasteries and monks are trying to practice this correct Vinaya according to uh, Lord Buddha's uh, uh, discourses and sutta. So next step will be the Abhidhamma. So give us some time. <laughs> OK, thank you very much, Pante, for sharing uh, your experience of Patana and Abhidhamma in Sri Lanka. Uh, any other more questions? We have about three minutes left, so one question. <laughs> OK. Uh, could you please introduce yourself and which institution? Uh, I'm you Dr. Jima. From uh, I'm a, a member of uh, uh, <coughs> uh, from uh, association from Yango. Uh, what I want to tell the uh, the venerable monks and public that I originally am. I originally was an uh, ear surgeon. That's why I stood up, stand up, and want to say something, maybe just an addendum. And uh, in my youthful ages, I, was, I came up from a village. And uh, a beta ma originally was uh, <coughs> resided at night. That's why we call it uh, a beta ma nyawa or nighttime study. And uh, they start uh, after uh, about 5 or 6 p.m. And then up to 10 p.m. Oh, it is uh, very sweet to hear. And uh, it is musical and very good to listen, of course. And I like it. So uh, when I grown up and become an ear surgeon, then I've learned so many, uh, what shall I say, uh, medical words that ear physiologically cannot accept loud voice for long times or uh, which are louder than 100 or 120 decibels. So recitation at night uh, by young monks is uh, very musical and very good to hear, but with loudspeakers. <laughs> And uh, 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 the, the sound box are very annoying. And I think there is uh, less than 1% of individuals who understand the value of patana 
and the meaning as well. Uh, that's why I am on the side of uh, non-user of the loudspeakers and <coughs> uh, amplifiers. Uh, that's my addendum. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for the comments. Uh, lastly, uh, I would like to ask our rector, Sarah, whether. <laughs> okay, <laughs> just leave. So it's now <clears throat> uh, the time is up. So uh, let me uh, hand over the mic to our MC to proceed on, please. Uh, thank you very much, Venerable Chair, Dr. Devina Pibawa, and our scholars, uh, Mr. Uh, Charles Shaw and Andrew Date, for their wonderful presentation. Yes, it's very a uh, lovely tradition of the recitation of Patana in Myanmar than how much you have explored on the sociological and anthropological basis. And yes, this use of microphone is also something to be considered. And if we vote, how, I don't know which will go, how many people will go to this site that it should be allowed, it should not be allowed. So we should be on the, I think, like sort of, um, we should have consideration for the environment because we, we respect the environment. So uh, there are many things to be considered from the side of the Patana and from the sociological background. And uh, thank you very much, Mr. Charles, also for the uh, valuable contributions that you have given. Then you say that living tradition means tradition that affects our life. So we will try to live up to that and we will all will try to uh, flesh out our life with the rich experience of the Abhidhamma knowledge. So now this is the time for the um, presentation of the certificate of appreciation and the souvenirs to our esteemed speakers. So may I uh, welcome our venerable chair to present the souvenirs and the certificate of appreciation to the speakers. Uh, Mr. Charles Scholz first, please. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Again, two traditions, sadhu and clapping. So we, yeah, both are, both are equally appreciated. Again, the same goes to sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So after the rich experience that you would have, you might like... Okay, the group photo for this session as well. Uh, I also would like to invite our Venerable Rector Siado and the Chair and the Speakers to pose for the group photo, please. Thank you. Thank you very much.